verses 1 through 3, and then leave your Bibles open to chapter 1. After we pray, we will be looking at the background to this text tonight. Nehemiah chapter 6, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies... You think you got enemies? <laughs> Nehemiah had enemies. Heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not yet set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? My text tonight is, I'm doing a great work. Why should I come down? Father, we thank you tonight for the work of God, the greatest enterprise in all the universe, the greatest kingdom in all the ages of the world combined, the Roman Empire, the Medes and the Persian Empire, the great Babylonian Empire, all of them put together doesn't compare to the kingdom of our Lord and Christ tonight. Father, we thank you tonight to be involved in the greatest work, the greatest endeavor the world has ever entertained. And Father, we're so thankful for that tonight. We're inspired by the words of Nehemiah, inspired to realize that we cannot come down and leave our priorities for any pressing issues that come against us in this hour. Come and help us tonight, Father, we pray, to preach thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. I cannot come down. I'm doing a great work. Do you feel that way? Is your priority as a Christian that you're doing a great work? Now, not that you're great. That wasn't what he was saying. But he was involved in a great endeavor. And I just go back for a little bit with me as we look at the background. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to Artaxerxes, the king at that time, and Nehemiah probably, I say probably, I can't really find for sure any documentation on how old he was, but the Babylonian captivity basically was already over, so that was 70 years. So if he had been one of the captives, he would have been in his 70s or 80s by this point, and I don't see Nehemiah being that old in this context, so probably he was actually born in captivity. He was actually born in, in, in this uh, Babylonian captivity. And because he was uh, probably of, of more noble birth, he was probably given an education like Moses and different ones in the palace of the king and actually rose to the very distinguished position of cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah had a very good position, probably a very profitable position, uh, a position with prestige. Not everybody got to enter the presence of the king. Not everybody got to entertain and, and be with the king's guest when he was entertaining. So when you think about where Nehemiah was in his position and the fact that he had never seen Jerusalem with his own eyes probably. He had never seen uh, Jerusalem, the homeland of his fathers and his ancestors. He had never been there. But we find here in chapter 1, and I'd like to read it because I think it gives us the, the sense of it real well. How it came to pass that Nehemiah was involved in the work of rebuilding the walls. If we get engaged in God's work, there has to be a point of time where something transpires in our heart that we see the need. We'll never ever really get engaged fully People come to church, some of them once, twice, some of them three times a week, and never really get engaged in the work of the Lord. But Nehemiah had an experience, and let's read it. You follow along as I read it. Chapter 1 of Nehemiah, it's very instructional, and it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. This is, I understand, the winter palace in Persia. That Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, 12 to 14 years prior to this time, Ezra had left with a group of Jews to begin the rebuilding of Jerusalem. If you read the book of Ezra, you'll find that. And they said unto me, these 
these kinsmen of him, whether it was actual brother, some suspect that it was actually Nehemiah's flesh and blood brother. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but some suspect that. He said, they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open unto that thou mayest hear, that thy eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept thy commandments, nor statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for he was the king's cupbearer. And as, as Nehemiah received the word of the situation at Jerusalem after 12 to 14 years, Either no progress had been made in the building of the walls and they were just like they were left when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. Or maybe some recent pillage of the city had torn down the progress that was made and the gates were again burned with fire. We're not real clear exactly why that was still in that position. We know that Ezra had a lot of things to deal with if you read the book of Ezra. And Ezra was a scribe and he was gifted in the law and he taught the people the right way and they had some very, very powerful uh, revival type things going on under the leadership of Ezra. But the work had come to a standstill. They'd all gotten discouraged. There was nothing going forward with the work. And when Nehemiah heard that, his heart was broken. He was put under a burden to pray and to fast and to seek God's face that something might change about that situation in Jerusalem. You know, if we look around at the church world today, the statistics are horrible about the modern church in the Western world. It would almost be unbelievable if I would read to you the statistics I read the other day at the number of youth pastors and the number of clergy that are hooked on, on pornography in America. I mean, these are people professing not only to be Christians, but to be called ministers of the gospel. Uh, the numbers were astounding. They were just out of this, uh, they just blew me out of the water when I read those statistics. And I think, Lord, surely our beloved holiness movement is not anywhere near that. I could hope and pray that it wouldn't be. But friend, when we take inventory of the church condition in our culture today, there ought to be something within us that says, this is not right. This is simply not right. I mean, the shepherds that should be tending the flock, they're hirelings. And you got all these false prophets that are propagating religious uh, things that are totally contrary to the scripture and followers by the thousands and, and tens of thousands following these false shepherds. But the condition of the church, the condition, and Jerusalem represented it was, you know, when you talk about Jerusalem, that was the capital of Judah. That was the place where God had said, I'm going to put my name here. This is the place where God said, you can build me a house. And I'll meet with you here when you meet with me, as long as you do my, keep my commandments. And so Jerusalem kind of represents the church in the old covenant. But today, as we look around, friend, our hearts ought to be stirred 
at the lethargy in our society about the things of God. Someone was conducting a poll several years ago, and I imagine this is a true statement. I heard it for truth. And so some reporter went out into the highways and the byways, and he was interviewing people. He said, what do you think's wrong with America? That was the question. What do you think's wrong with America? The very first person he come to gave him two answers. He said, I don't know, and I don't care. The reporter said, you got both of them. That's what's wrong with America. And friend, it would be sad to say that that's what's wrong with the church. We don't want to know the state that we're in. We're happy to be ignorant. We're happy to be totally in the dark. Lord, don't tell me anything, preacher. I don't want to know anything. And furthermore, I don't care what those people do. I don't care if they're being led to hell by the millions. I don't care if they're being lied to by false teachers. I don't care if they're being deceived by false prophets. I don't care if this crowd that's carried away with the gifts and things are, are deceiving people. Friend, we ought to care. We really ought to care what's happening to our own beloved movement. I believe John Wesley, if it were possible to roll over in your grave, which that's an old statement and it's not possible for those bones to move. But I was listening to the radio some years ago now and there was a professed homosexual who happened to be an ordained Methodist minister and he made the statement on the national radio program. He said, if John Wesley were alive today, he would approve of our lifestyle. Now, if he didn't turn over at that point, he'll never turn over. But friend, we're living in a day where the church is ordaining homosexuals. We're living in a day where they're marrying people of the same sex. We're living in a day, friend, I mean, it's not just... A, it's not divorce and remarriage anymore. It's all this perversion. The walls are torn down. Jerusalem is in sad shape. And the church has gotten discouraged. And God needs to speak to someone's heart. Some younger person's heart. And show them the condition of the church. And do what he did for Nehemiah. Nehemiah couldn't get away from this burden. God had put it on his heart. God had laid these people on his heart. And friend, there was some phenomenal, phenomenal. This burden that God put on Nehemiah's heart led him to contrite prayer and fasting. Weeping and praying and fasting. It led him to present this thing of rebuilding the, the, the city of Jerusalem to, to the king himself. And it led Nehemiah away from a comfortable lifestyle in a highly respected position to go up there and be the governor of, of Jerusalem and get involved in the hands-on work of rebuilding that city for God. Do you believe God can still do that today? Oh, I tell you, friend, to answer the call of God, to hear the voice of God, to see and let, let know that God has put his hand on your life is the greatest thing outside of salvation that I know about. To have God put his hand on you and say, I want to use you. I want you to do this for me. I want you to be a missionary. I want you to be a, a Christian school teacher. I want you to be a song evangelist. I want you to be a pastor or evangelist. I want you in full-time Christian service. Nehemiah answered the call of God. He answered this call of God and he did it at a great personal self-sacrifice. But I like what Alexander McLaren says. He said, no man will do worthy work at rebuilding the walls who has not wept over the ruins. No man will be fit to go up there and rebuild the walls until he's troubled and weeping over the ruins and the mess that things are in now. Friends, we need to let God show us the mess 
that we're in now. We need to let God show us the dire circumstances that even our beloved movement is in now. We have fragmented to the point that we're nothing but matchsticks most places. I thank God for the 34 people. That's 34 souls this morning that were in this church. But I could say from years gone by and even before I met you all the first time, this church was teeming with people. The school was teeming with students. And I'm not trying to lay any blame tonight. That's not my intent at all. I don't want anybody to say, well, he thinks it's my fault. No, not at all. What I want us to see is the condition that the walls are in in our churches. We had a school at Bremen for 30 years. It's closed now. We ran 125 in church. They're running 30 now. But I want to tell you, it bothers me because I'm a kingdom Christian. Not just what happens at Bowling Springs is important. What happens over in Easley and what happens out here up the road. And the best I can tell, there's not but a half a dozen holiness churches in this state. Maybe you can correct me. Maybe you can point them out to me. But I haven't been able to find them, friend. As far as old-fashioned conservative holiness churches, there are few and far between in South Carolina. That's why some of these people no doubt drive the distance they drive to get here. But friend, this is a lighthouse. We can't afford the walls to crumble here. We can't afford to see the work go into decay here. We must see revival. And God must lay it upon someone's heart that has the drive and the passion and has the burden to see the walls built back up. Amen? Lord, help us. We don't want to see our churches in disarray. We don't want to see our churches down to just a handful. It, it shouldn't be that way. He's a worthy Lord. He's a glorious King. He needs to be worshipped by this crowd of people around us. He needs to be worshipped by them, and they need to worship Him more than He needs to be worshipped by them. So church, we have a phenomenal task and the walls are in disarray and the gates are burned and, and the condition of the modern church in America at least is in sad, sad shape. Went by a church in Columbus several years ago. They were having a big shindig trying to get people in and they advertised in a big banner right beside the road, free beer. There's another big church in Somerset that raffles off a car every year to get promotions going. So let's get them drunk, let's get them gambling, let's get them doing those things to get them into church. Nonsense. Friend, we better have a revival in America or we're in bad, bad shape. And I know the government's a mess. And I know the economy's a mess. And I know we're in for a civil war if things don't change in America. But I want to tell you, the church is going to have to lay some of the responsibility at our feet because we sit by and let Washington do what it did Back in the 60s when they started taking prayer out of the school, when they started taking the Bible out of school, where was the church, friend? We've been sleeping for now four decades or five decades. So what can I do, preacher, now I'm older? I can't go and rebuild the walls. I can't get out there and do like I used to do, preacher. So many of us are in that shape, friend, but what we need to do is pray that God will lay it upon some young Nehemiah. God will raise up some Nehemiahs, some young men, some young women that have a passion for God's work and can weep over the ruins and see the devastation and have a desire to whatever the cost, I'm going to help build this thing back up. It's a big price to leave secular work. When I left U.S. Steel back in 19, early 80s, I was bringing home $400 a week. That was after taxes and all the deductions. That's back in the early 80s. And I took a church and they said, we'll give you 150 a week if we've got it. Can I tell you and report to you after 36 years of full-time ministry, God has never failed us one time. God has never shortchanged us. God has never left us in default. He's never left us without the need being supplied. I want to tell you it's a thrill to walk with God and serve God and be committed to the work of God, friend, and let the secular world have its thing. 
The clothes we have worn across the last 30, 40 years, a lot of them have came from secondhand stores, but you wouldn't know it. If we didn't tell you, you wouldn't know it. I laughed at him somewhere one time. I was wearing a Hart Schaffner and Mark suit. My uncle, bless his memory, he bragged about paying $500 for his. I probably paid 10 for mine. I say, who's the better businessman here? I tell you, friend, it's not, it's not in having everything the world has. It's got its trinkets, it's got its toys, it's got its entertainment, it's got its riches and luxury and pleasure and ease. But I want to tell you, there's a cause tonight that you and I need to pray that someone, God will lay his hand on someone's to start working in our movement to see a real rebuilding of the wall. But Nehemiah had a burden. Nehemiah had a boldness. Nehemiah went to the king and presented his request to the king. Found favor in the eyes of the king. When God said it, friend, God can open the doors. Most of these pagan kings weren't real sympathetic to Jerusalem. But we find Cyrus was and we find Artaxerxes was and we find that God moved upon their hearts and God even used old Nebuchadnezzar. But he used him to punish Jerusalem. But God is looking for someone that can look on the situation in our day and see the devastation that has been wrought in our churches by the encroaching of the world and by the things that are poisoning our system and by the divisiveness and division within the body of Christ. Friend, the devil has scattered the power of the holy people just like Daniel's prophecy said he would in the last days. You conquer by dividing. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Brother Clyde was preaching and teaching on unity this morning. How we need that message today. When we need to bind together and pull together. There's a great work. Amen. You have to realize you're, in, you're involved in the Lord's work. You're involved in a great work. And there's always going to be distractions to try to pull you aside. I've had offers for pretty nice jobs across the years. But when I settled it to leave U.S. Steel... I settled it to be a full-time preacher. And I've managed to, to maintain that status now for 36 years. Without other secular employment, I did dabble in life insurance as a sideline for just a little while, but I got out of that. People are dying. Why well, sell them life insurance? They're dying. They can't spend it. Someone else is going to spend the money. But I want you to know tonight, this is a great work. And it is a worthy work of you and your time and your energies and your abilities and your talents that God has given you. It's a worthy work tonight, church. And all the sand ballots and Tobias that are trying their best to tear it down, there's always opposition to God's work. There always has been. There always will be opposition. The sad part is when the opposition comes from within. That's when it's really sad. When the hindrance is setting within the walls of the church, where we need to come together. This is a great work. This church is important to God. This ministry is vital to the people around this church of getting to God. There's backsliders in this community. I know there are. There's people that have never heard the holiness message in this community. I know there are. We are needed here. We are needed here. For God. And it's a great work. We have a beautiful facility. We have wonderful grounds. We have a nice location right along a busy street. There's housing divisions going up all around us. No lack of people to talk to. But we need some Nehemiahs that have seen, they've seen the vision. They've caught the burden. They've realized that more important than being a cupbearer to the king, I've got a work to do for God. And I'll forsake the king in the palace at Sushan, and I'll leave that luxury and lifestyle and prestige and power, and I'll go out here and get me a trowel and get me a pick hammer or get whatever I need and go to work on the wall. 
Amen. So there are not many preachers willing to make that sacrifice today. You're right. And I fear our Bible colleges aren't really, aren't really providing us with the preachers, friend. They're not really providing us with, with those that have a real burden and a real desire to see the walls built and realize that they're called into the greatest work in the universe. This is the greatest thing you could ever be called to. It's the work of God. And Nehemiah caught that vision. He caught that burden. And he went over there and he began to organize. He began to, to put his efforts and his administrative ability and his organizational ability and his overseeing capacity into full gear. And he went out at night. Friend. He didn't even let anybody know what he was doing when he got there. He went out and evaluated the condition of the city for three nights in a row with nobody else knowing what he was doing. He didn't come in there to make a big splash and a big name for himself. He come in there to see what the problem was and see what the remedy needed to be and let's get busy. Let's get at it. Amen? I think we all know where the remedy is. I think we all know where some of the problems are. I think we all realize that if God doesn't begin to move, if God doesn't begin to shake this community, if God doesn't begin to work in our blessed movement, friend, we are not going to have a movement. And that sounds almost treasonous, doesn't it? To say that. But just be a student of history for just a moment. I mentioned John Wesley. His beloved Methodist movement that God give him a revival of great magnitude, great proportion. And it lasted for almost 150 years. That's long. In the history of movements and revivals, that's a long time. Then the Nazarenes came out and the Free Methodist and the Wesleyan Methodist and the Pilgrim Holiness and you just go on down the line, friend. And When the old mother church began to let up, there was those come outers that said, we're not going along with this. We're not going down with the ship. Thank God they weren't. Then, that's, then those movements began to wax cold. Our, our, the movement I was, the denomination I was saved in the Wesleyan church there in southern West Virginia back in the late 70s, had a revival. We were one of the last conferences that caved in in the Wesleyan Church. But it wasn't long until they was making fun of preachers like me and Mark Hunter. Some of the rest of us old boys had gotten really saved, believed you needed to take the Bible away and clean up and line up and get saved and get out of sin business and look like a Christian and act like a Christian. They even accused us of taking the place of the Holy Ghost during camp meeting because we testified what we'd been delivered from. But friends, I doubt if they have a dozen churches left in West Virginia today. The very church I was saved in has been razed to the ground. It's, it's gone. Nothing but a gravel lot where it used to be. We can, we can abandon our principles. We can abandon our roots at great price, the walls will be torn down. The gates will be burned with fire, maybe not literally, but the churches and our beloved movement, friend, we're no better. We're no different than those other movements that I've mentioned to you. The Salvation Army. The first evangelist I had at my pastor at Annawalt, West Virginia, just green as grass, preacher. In fact, I pastored it for two years as a layman. Till they could get a preacher. And then God called me to preach. And uh, Brother L.S. Steele, he must have been 90 years old. After, after lunch, he'd go back into the room. And my little girls were little. Brother Steele go back and say, well, I'm going to stretch out a message before the Lord. And bless his old heart, he'd go back in the room and pretty soon the door was rattling. I mean, he was snoring so loud. But he still had the fire. He didn't have much physical strength. But he still had the fire, friend, and he tells me on his wedding night, on their honeymoon, they took a train to Cincinnati, Ohio. And this was back in the early 1900s when he got married. He said, we took a train to Cincinnati, Ohio. He said, there at the depot when we got off the train, there was a little Salvation Army band, and they were playing their instruments and preaching the gospel. He said, they said, we joined right with them that night. On our honeymoon night, it had street meetings with the Salvation Army. Friend, do they still do that today? I want to beg of you, friend. The fire and the blood was their motto. And they were ablaze for a period of time. 
but the fire goes out and the walls come down and pretty soon the devil and the world's running the program. I'm not trying to be unkind to anybody. I'm just telling you the facts. And somebody will write the history of this church one day. Somebody will recount the history of this church one day. If they'd only had a Nehemiah, if they'd only had a Nehemiah or two to raise up and answer the call and get the burden of the Lord and say, I'm doing a good work. I can't come down, Sam Ballot. He knew what he was up to anyway. But he said, I can't come down. I'm doing a good work. Four or five times the guy changed the location. If you don't like Golden Corral, let's go to Western Sizzling. Let's meet over here at the roadhouse or let's meet. No, no. I'm doing a great work. And if I leave the work, the work will slow down. The work will stop. And friend, if we don't see some laborers and some, some people with a burden and a vision that are going to really get behind the work of the kingdom. Some of us are getting older. Some of us can't do what we used to do. Can't spend the hours we used to spend. But let me read you in closing. I wanted to read a passage out of Isaiah in closing. Isaiah 58. Verses 6 through 12, I think. 12 or 13. Isaiah 58. Listen to these words. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? to let the oppressed go free and that they break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shall thou call and the Lord shall answer Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. Praise God, that's what we want, isn't it? Is to get in a place where we call God answers. God responds immediately, here I am. Here I am. Oh, thank God, friend. I want to get in that place, don't you? The revival of the church until they call and God says, here I am. What do you want now? Praise God. He said, here I am. Now let me find out where I was. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness is be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee, our posterity, whether spiritual children or our physical children, listen, they shall be of thee that shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Friend, that's the fast we need. That is the plea we need. We need to go back and say, Lord, what are we lacking? Where are we missing it? Let us get in the place where you are so pleased with us that when we call, you will answer and say, here I am. Here I am. What do you need? What is it that you desire of me? Friend, what a day when the church is back in love with Jesus and the church is back in harmony with one another until the fire and the glory falls upon us one more time. I long to see it myself. I remember a revival meeting. We hadn't been saved very long. And that's the days when Archie B. Atwell was going around preaching as an evangelist. How many heard Archie B. Atwell? He's nothing like the preaching of his son and his son does a great job. But Archie Barthel Atwell, what a name. No wonder he just used the initial. But he was a unique preacher. He could use humor. He could have you kind of laughing. And then the next moment, he could say something that would sober you to the point, oh. 
And I remember being in a little church at a little place called Lorton Lick, West Virginia. It was probably a fourth this size, maybe a third this size of this building. But it was packed that night. The place was full. Archie Atwell was preaching and the God of heaven came down into that little place, friend. And the glory of the Lord swept through that place. You've seen rain as it blew in sheets. Just one sheet of rain after another. That's what I picture the glory as I was, as I was sitting there enthralled and thrilled to my core and blessed out of my skin because of the glory of the Lord that was in that place. It just seemed like one wave of glory would hit and then it would subside a little and another wave of glory would hit. And my, did we have a service that night. God coming in power and visitation. I want these young people to see that. I want this younger generation to see what I've seen because I've tasted enough that it's spoiled me for all this out here. I've seen enough that I don't need the world to give me entertainment. I don't need the world to provide me with my thrills and joy. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. And he does a wonderful job of it. Do you know that? And it's a great work, church. And we dare not be distracted from it. We dare not come down from that which is priority for those things that are pressing us. And there's always something pressing us in this day. Amen? The devil sees to it that we are pressed. When you go to pray, there's something in your mind or the phone's ringing or you've got an appointment in a little bit and there's something in this busy, busy age that's continually causing us and pulling us away from that which is primary. That's the work of God. That's keeping in touch with God. That's seeing God move on our community and our family and our loved ones. Where are the Nehemiahs? Would you pray with me that God will find them? God will single them out and send us some Nehemiahs. They may be like John Wesley. They may be like John Fletcher. They may, be like, they may be like Peter Cartwright. If you've never read his book, you ought to read it. Peter Cartwright, the backwoods preacher. Now, he was a different brand of holiness. Most of the holiness preachers today would call him carnal. But Peter Cartwright got in it for the, he was in it all the way. Whatever it took, he wasn't coming down. He was going to stand true to God. And we need men and women like that today. We do. We need a revival, folks, where God puts a burden and a vision on another generation. Every generation must have their own revelation of God. I can't seem to pass my revelation on to you. I can tell you about it. And you say, boy, that must have been nice. But by the time you get home and get ready for the snack, you've done forgot about it. But when God reveals himself to you, as God revealed himself to me, I haven't gotten over it yet. I never want to get over it. I never want to get over what Jesus has done for me. Praise God tonight. So young Nehemiah, if you're back there, come and give yourself to Jesus. Say, so Lord, I'll give you my life. I'll help build the walls. I'll see to it that the Community Bible Church has another generation of glory. Amen. Amen. Friend, if we don't, we're in trouble. So please pray that way. God will raise them up. Amen. It's life or death for the church. It really is. It's life or death for our holiness churches. When you get down to 20 and 30 and 15 and 20, and some churches I, I heard the evangelist and his wife went there, and counting the evangelist and his wife, they had five. Five? In our churches? And we're not weeping yet? Lord, help me. Lord, help me. If he can give me the strength of my youth, I'll use it. How about you? If he did like Moses, he was 80 years old. Said his strength never abated. Said he never got old. He walked to his own funeral, laid down and died. What a way to go. <laughs> 
He walked to his own funeral. There wasn't any pallbearers in Moses' life. He was 120 years old. He walked up the mountain to his own funeral. That's all right. I'd just soon die that way as any I know of when you. Praise God. So you're being silly. No. If he could do it for Moses, he can do it for us. He can renew our strength, church. But he can also lay it upon the hearts of some young folk that have that energy and have that dynamic, that youthful zeal that means so much in getting people into the house of God. All right, well, I've labored the point long enough. Stand with me for dismissal prayer.